Yes, I really like this voice. Uh, recording in progress. It sounds really, really sort of uh, uh, kind and polite. Um, hello and welcome everybody to the uh, first event in the new media and contemporary culture series in the summer semester. Uh, my guest today is Professor Daniel Nayland from Oxford University, um, and I am pretty excited to um, to listen to his uh, talk um, in so far as the. Uh, subject of algorithms is a recurring problem in my research uh, on digital phenomena and post-digital uh, culture phenomena. Um, so just a little bit uh, uh, about Professor Nayland. Um, his research interests cover issues of governance, accountability and ethics in forms of science, technology and organization. He draws on ideas from ethnomethodology, science and technology studies, and his research is ethnographic in orientation. Across a number of research projects, he has ethnographically engaged with markets, cement, security and surveillance, traffic management, waste, airports, biometrics, parking, signposts, malaria vaccines, universities, algorithms, and speeding drivers, um, which is an uh, exhaustive uh, list in itself. Um, and the title of his talk is uh, One More Time with Feeling Algorithms, AI, and the Composition of the Child. Daniel, the floor is completely yours. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, so um, yeah, I'm gonna present some work today that I've been doing for the last couple of years, this this is a project that began uh, just before the, the COVID pandemic, and then um, I've been kind of working on the data since then. And um, I've been really interested to hear um, your ideas and thoughts and, and questions at the end. This is very much not uh, uh, a kind of finished piece of work. It's at an interesting stage, I think. Of you know, I'm going to probably be publishing this in the next year or so. So um, all thoughts and questions that you have are very welcome. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is, is, is yeah, as, as Bart said, this kind of combination of algorithms, artificial intelligence, and a bit of machine learning today. Focus specifically on um, emotion recognition, which I think is a really interesting example of how this technology uh, is, um, well, th th at least there's efforts to try and, and sort of develop and use this technology and find use cases for this technology at the moment. So the technology itself is also at an interesting stage. I'm a social scientist and not a, a computer scientist. I often get called in by these large collaborative European funded projects to provide ethical advice on these technology developments. And that's where today's uh, uh, data comes from, one of these projects that I worked on. I think these technologies, the combination of algorithms, artificial intelligence, machine learning, raises a series of ethical questions. And um, I'm going to sort of pose some of those for you today and see, see what you think about those, but also come in with your own you know, ethical ideas and insights and thoughts and questions at the end, if you like. So let's just dive straight into the talk. Now, one of the things that I'm confronted with when I'm trying to address the potential ethical issues, concerns, and questions that might arise, and if I'm providing ethical advice on a project, the kinds of ethical issues I should be engaging with. One of the challenges that arises is how to make sense of these quite complex and sometimes quite opaque technologies that are being developed. For example, you know, computer scientists might be working on many, many, many lines of computer code, which are not particularly readable. Or, for example, algorithms are sometimes quite difficult to access. I'll show you an algorithm in a moment just so we can have a look at how that works. One of the things that I try and do in making sense of these technology developments is to look at the different types of framing that we can provide, none of which are necessarily perfect or provide us with complete access to all the ethical issues that we want to engage with, but different framings which provide us with different ways of thinking about perhaps what the problems are at stake, what kinds of ethical questions we might want to engage with. One of these frames of reference is the kind of historical development of these technologies. So where have we come from? How come we've reached the point that we have? An interesting point of development in these algorithmic technologies that try and do some form of recognition is probably late 1950s. The work of people like Frank Rosenblatt, Cornell, quite crucial here. 
to developing a particular kind of way of understanding how machines could learn, how computers could be developed that might make decisions themselves. Rosenblatt was involved in, in, a, in the development of a technology called the perceptron, and the perceptron became the name of a particular algorithm, which was widely taken up and used. The perceptron initially was one of these huge computers about the size of a room. A room had to be specially built to house the computer, weighed about five tons. And the perceptron was a machine that was used to try and recognize gender through photographs, okay? And the idea behind this, at least as far as Rosenblatt was concerned, was that the machine would make its own decisions and the machine would learn how to make those decisions. Now, this is the 1950s, right? So there weren't kind of streams of digital video data in the way there are now. This involved an individual scientist feeding paper printed photographs into the machine. The machine would then decide whether that was a photograph of someone male or someone female. If the computer came back with the right answer, the computer scientist would then push a lever saying, yes, that was correct. And it had this kind of reinforcement learning loop where the more times the computer got the answer correct, the more times it would then try and use the same basis for answering the same question again, but using different photos. So this was called a binary classifier. It can make a decision between two bodies of things. It could answer yes or no, right or wrong, or in this case, male or female. Couldn't do anything else. This led to big problems with the machine itself. It didn't have a lot of utility. There weren't many companies lining up to say, yes, we would like a room-sized computer through which we can feed uh, you know, printed out photographs that would then decide whether they're male or female. There wasn't much use to it. And this technology dies out really in the 1960s and leads to what some people call the AI winter, this kind of long period, which I think really goes into the 1990s, although some people place a different date on it. But this long period where there's a kind of hiatus in development of these sorts of technologies. Much of Rosenblatt's work after this period is, is kind of discredited in some way, or at least marginalized and, and, and not taken up. I'll send Bart the slides of this, this presentation afterwards. And if you want to, you can watch this video on YouTube, which gives a kind of uh, a recording from the 1950s of the perceptron at work. So it's kind of interesting to look at. Thanks for that, Daniel. Thanks very yeah. much. What this, what this um, example of the perceptron can help us to think about is where this beginning of recognition, in this case, face recognition comes from, right? Comes from the idea of binary classification. It comes from the idea of the computer scientists themselves setting effectively a series of rules, which the machine is then gonna work within, but the machine is also gonna start making its own decisions, right? What we can also look at here is, is what we might understand as a very limited sense of gender. Right? There's only that male or female, that's it. It's very binary, you know, it's called a binary classifier for a reason. So although Rosenblatt talks about the computer making its own decisions, in effect, it's making decisions within a kind of limited structure that's designed by the computer scientists. So we'll come back to that. So that's one kind of way of framing what's going on in these kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, projects. What we see from the sort of late 1990s onwards is a resurgence of interest in these sorts of technologies. Partly this is because there's a lot more data available. Much of this data comes from the growth in the 1990s of things like um, video surveillance networks, public area CCTV systems, for example. My own country, the UK, is um, uh, unfortunately a sort of pioneer in this area because the national government put a lot of money into uh, the funding of things like public area CCTV. As we move into the 2000s and these increasingly become digital systems, this just creates huge volumes of data, streams of digital video data, which are um, you know, somewhat expensive to monitor if you just have actual human beings sat there 24 hours a day looking at huge banks of monitors the whole time. And so it becomes something more like an appropriate organizational use in some way to have a system sift through this stream of digital video data. This leads to the birth of what we might call video analytics. There's some other terms for it, but this is the most popular one, I think, among computer scientists. Video analytics is the field of um, developing 
algorithms and associated software code to sift through streams of digital video data, effectively to pick out patterns in that data, and then for the computer itself to make decisions about that data. It was a little bit like the perceptron, but kind of updated um, using digital data. There's now much more data available. This is no longer, of course, just about face recognition, but has led over the last sort of 20 years, but particularly accelerated over the last 10 years, um, led to the development of all kinds of different ways of, of sort of recognizing different things within the data, recognizing faces, recognizing ways of walking, recognizing patterns of behavior, recognizing, as we're going to go on to look at today, emotions, or at least that's the claim. Unlike the binary classifier of the perceptron that can just do yes or no, or male or female, these depend on what are called multi-layered neural networks, which make a kind of more complex set of decisions. But as we'll see, there's still some similarities a little bit to the perceptron, I think. So this development from the late 1990s almost provides us with a different way of thinking about what the issues are at stake. This is now about large scale data. This is now about a more independent technology. It doesn't really depend on a computer scientist feeding in still photographs. It's much more sophisticated than that. And it's about systems making multiple types of decisions within a very short time frame, almost like an instant decision. What we also see at this time, of course, is a range of different scare stories that emerge as the technology becomes more sophisticated and as more examples of this technology emerge. Just looking at the, 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 the example of emotions, we get lots of stories coming out around things like um, sentiment analysis, around things like emotion analysis online, and uh, scare stories around things like how social media companies perhaps try and sort of influence and shape our emotional responses by providing particular stories into our news feeds, all of those sorts of things. We also start to see uh, stories about um, uh, other sorts of machines. So this is an example that, that, that the story began in about 2015 and runs through to about 2020, about um, a, a children's toy called Hello Barbie, which was a Wi-Fi connected version of Barbie, which claimed to be able to use artificial intelligence in order to hold conversations with children who would hold the toy, right? So the child says hello to Barbie, that gets communicated through Wi-Fi to uh, a cloud data analysis system, which then decides what the appropriate response is, and then Barbie talks back to the child. And Barbie effectively has thousands of different responses that it can offer, right? So it's about kind of voice recognition and about responding to it. The kind of scare stories we see here, are about things like, you know, what happens to this data? Who controls this data? Is it possible for people to hack into the doll and start talking to the children themselves and so on? So this provides a different kind of frame of reference for thinking about what sorts of ethical issues might arise with this technology. Issues about control, issues about the scale of data, issues perhaps starting to move towards things like privacy, about control, about what might be appropriate forms of regulation or policy to have in place. Completely different sort of frame of reference, but it has some connections to those scare stories, is recent academic work on this. I'm not going to try and sort of uh, uh, talk through any of this. I've just put up sort of examples of, you know, this kind of big explosion of work we've seen on this area over the last sort of 10 years. And this academic work is interesting for kind of going into more depth in relation to things like issues of regulation. There's this kind of ongoing stream of work on things like algorithmic accountability and what that might look like. How do you make one of these sorts of machines that appear on the surface at least so uh, opaque and so distant from us and, and require so much kind of technological skills to sort of understand what it is that the technology does? How do you make those accountable? How could you ever make them transparent to the extent where you could govern them, for example? So again, here in the academic work, we see a little bit of that theme of the machine out of control. We also see a lot more depth around how we might understand things like privacy in the 21st century, the possibilities of regulation, the possibilities of governing this technology, but also doing governance through technology. Right. So there's some kind of interesting issues there around how these technologies don't just do one thing and don't just raise one set of questions. They raise kind of multiple questions at the same time questions about the sorts of things we might be able to do with this technology and also the sorts of threats that we might face because of this technology. 
I've talked about this before in terms of the technologies being both problem and solution. So it becomes quite interesting to think about how we might sort of deal with that, how we might engage with that. When we're trying to address things like ethical issues in the design of new technologies. Okay. The kind of final frame of reference that I'm going to talk about today is science fiction. Okay. So this, I don't really take science fiction to necessarily sort of provide a, a, a specific or singular truth about the, the, the state of the world that we're in. But science fiction is interesting for kind of giving us ideas for thinking about how technology might get taken up and used. It gives us kind of ideas for thinking through ethics of technology. The example from science fiction I'm gonna talk about today is Blade Runner. I don't know if you've seen the original Blade Runner film. Um, it's a violent film, so I won't kind of necessarily recommend you, you do go and watch it, but if you do wanna watch it, it's interesting at least for uh, providing a frame of reference for how we might understand um, the development of technology. Blade Runner is interesting because although it was made in 1982, it's set in 2019 going into 2020. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a, a 1982 depiction of what um, the filmmakers thought we might be experiencing right now in the 2020s, right? So it's kind of interesting on that basis, if nothing else. Just in case you haven't seen the film, the central idea of the film is that these synthetic humans um, are sent off to work on colonies on other planets to do the kind of work that we don't really want to do. But many of these escape and return to Earth. And the Blade Runner is more like a detective who tries to track down um, possible synthetic humans uh, and test them effectively to see if they are human or not. And then um, if they uh, tend to turn out to be synthetic humans, they are removed from society in quite um, violent ways. In some respects, this is similar to the kind of media scare stories that we just saw. It's a little bit about the machine out of control. What's also interesting for the example that I'm going to talk about today is that emotion recognition sits at the heart of Blade Runner. So um, when the detectives are trying to distinguish uh, between possible synthetic humans and um, other humans, um, they set a test for these possible synthetic humans. They sit them down in front of a camera, the camera reads their emotions, and the detective or Blade Runner asks the possible synthetic human questions. These questions are designed to be complex emotional scenarios, and the claim of the film is if you're human you'll be able to deal with this complex emotional scenario, if you're a synthetic human you won't be able to, right? So this will be the key arbiter for distinguishing between synthetic and non-synthetic humans. It's a bit like a binary classifier. It's a bit like the perceptron, except that classification is around emotions. If you can deal with emotions, you're human. If you can't deal with emotions, you're synthetic. That's the kind of claim of the film. So it involves asking questions like, I'll just read this question out because this will become relevant later on in the talk. Okay, so this is, this is one of the questions that gets asked as part of this test. Okay, so you're sat in front of a camera and then the uh, the Blade Runner says, uh, you're in a desert walking along in the sand when all of a sudden you look down and you see a tortoise and it's crawling towards you. You reach down and you flip the tortoise on its back. It's trying to turn itself over, but it can't, not without your help, but you're not helping. Why is that? And at this point in the film, the synthetic humans have real trouble dealing with this situation and that reveals them to be synthetic and, and, and you know, humans would presumably be able to, to deal with it. This is the assumption of the film. A little bit like the perceptron, it sets out um, problematic, uh, sort of limited sense of what it is to be human. Uh, you know, in, in, in the perceptron's case, it's about gender and this kind of very limited binary sense of gender. Here is a very kind of clear cut sense of emotions that in some way uh, uh, complex emotions can be dealt with by humans. And I think, you know, we probably know that there's all sorts of complex emotional situations that we don't cope with very well. Anyway, um, the film's got this kind of bleak dystopian aspect to it. Um, it doesn't really look much like our 2020s, fortunately, as we actually experience them now, but it's at least interesting for looking at how a machine could be involved in understanding our emotions, how tests could be designed to um, effectively bring those emotions out. Okay, so we'll come back to those things in the next part of the talk. So 
What I want to do now is move to this particular project where I was called in to, to, to provide ethical advice. And I'll be interested to hear your views on this afterwards. Of course, raise views about any point of the presentation you want, but this is the bit that I'm working on at the moment. So I'm um, moving away from the kind of science fiction depiction of the 2020s into our actual 2020s as we experience them now. Um, this is um, a, a European project which involves multiple partners from across different countries in Europe, publicly funded project, but it brings together um, academic computer scientists and um, industry, and, and me as a social scientist, as an ethical advisor. And the effort here is to build an algorithmic or artificial intelligent child's doll, which will recognize children's emotions, okay, and then offer appropriate responses to those emotions. The suggestion in the project documentation is that this will be useful for therapeutic situations, right? So the idea is that there are certain therapeutic situations involving children where those children might have trouble expressing their emotions particularly if they've been involved in traumatic incidents involving adults. They might have trouble uh, expressing their emotions freely to adults, for example, in a medical setting. So here the doll is there for the children to play with, and the doll will read the child's emotion and communicate that to medical professionals within the setting. There's also, though, a strong suggestion that there's an attempt here to evade Kind of ethical censure or the kind of normal ethical regulations that would apply to this kind of project. So in all of the previous projects I'd worked on up until this point, I would be invited in as an ethical advisor at the point where the funding bid was sort of being put together and our ideas were being sort of drawn together and I would contribute to those ideas. In this project, it was much later on. It's after the funding had already been agreed and the project was set up and about to start, the research funders became very anxious about the potential ethical issues involved in this technology and the absence of any adequate ethical oversight here. So I was called in a bit later in the day to look at this. The funders were concerned that the people developing this technology were presenting it as if it was a therapeutic tool in order to evade some of the normal ethical questions that would, uh, that would arise around how this technology would be used. We'll come back to that question of use in a moment. Because just as the perceptron had problems in sort of demonstrating its use, this technology also raises ethical questions about how it might be used. Let's just sort of present a few details on how the technology is designed to work. So the doll has a tiny camera, which um, produces a stream of digital video data and a data processing chip that communicates that data to the cloud. So the doll itself, a bit like the Hello Barbie doll, doesn't really have the kind of sophisticated data analysis or data processing tools that would be required to do emotion recognition. But by transmitting the data to the cloud, to a cloud-based analysis system, uh, that's where the analysis can take place. So the cloud-based video analytics system is designed to ascertain the, the emotional state of the child but also to communicate back to the doll what it should say back to the child in particular situations. And when I had arrived at the project, the, pro the, 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 the technology, the prototype technology had already been tried on over 6,000 still images um, from 700 different people who were displaying particular emotions. So this wasn't a binary classifier. The system was a bit more uh, sophisticated than that but it was classifying emotions into this uh, 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 set of emotions that I've put on the screen here. So it could tell things like anger and disgust and sadness and surprise, okay? So it was effectively classifying all emotional responses into one of those categories. And the computer scientists claimed that in tests, at least, this had about an 86% accuracy rate. It could accurately uh, ascertain emotions at that rate. That depended on a computer scientist looking at the responses offered by uh, the system and agreeing that those images that had been used did also express that emotion. So there's some complexity there. So from the, um, the, the project documentation, here's a, you know, a series of diagrams about how this technology is designed to work, right? So there's a doll, it's got this camera on it, it's got a speaker that can talk back to the child. 
This is the algorithm that partly underpins this. There's quite a lot of stuff in the academic literature at the moment about the opacity of algorithms. So it's not completely uninteresting, I don't think, to look at algorithms like this. You know, when we have the chance to actually see an algorithm, we can look at it. This is an algorithm which, as you can see, is a kind of series of, of um, uh, text boxes with arrows, with uh, points sort of linking them together. So this kind of algorithm is effectively a set of embedded instructions, right? One thing leads to another, but it does have these kind of recursive feedback loops that we can see uh, to the right hand side, which show, um, you know, effectively how the decision flow of the system ought to work. If there's a no or a yes at particular points, it leads either backwards through the diagram or onto a different kind of action. Right? So that's how the algorithm is designed to work. Ethically, it's possible sometimes to look at these and to sort of pick out some perhaps what we might call politically contentious aspects of the design of the algorithm. But this was already in place by the time I was called into this particular project. In other, in other uh, projects where I've worked on them from a kind of earlier stage, it's been relatively interesting, that hasn't taken up huge amounts of my time, but relatively interesting to work with the computer scientists to say, you know, what would happen if we had different text in the boxes or a different order to the boxes on you. So you can kind of get a little bit into what the consequences are of designing your algorithm in particular ways. And of course, there's a huge amount of um, uh, software and, and, and hardware actually that, that sort of underpins this and actually makes the system work. So the suggestion is that, you know, if a child's happy, the doll will read that. If it's sad, it will read that. This is the actual doll that was used in the, in the, uh, the early stages of the project. It's slightly more basic and slightly more crude than the uh, pictures in the initial project documentation book, perhaps. Um, uh, and you can see here that, um, as you pointed out in the picture, the camera is kind of uh, 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 just stuck to the head of the doll and they put a hat over the top of the camera. And uh, the doll is sat next to a laptop here, which is the kind of results that you would get from at least the trial stage of this technology. It would tell you the emotion that had been picked out by the doll and it would give that emotion a score. So one is the highest you can get here for any emotion, but you might also get sort of 0.8 happiness or 0.6 anger, that kind of thing. You would only get one emotion each time. So it picks out what it thinks the emotional state is. And over a prolonged interaction, that emotion could change. But in any particular moment, it just gives you one emotion and a score out of one for that emotion. So if you turn the dough over, the, the technology is, is even more kind of simplistic and crude. There's just a series of um, uh, 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 bits of technology strapped to the back of the dough, and this is the bit that really communicates to the uh, cloud processing system and then uh, gets feedback from that system to then offer a response to the child in the therapeutic situation. Okay. So, so far, we might be thinking about some particular kinds of ethical questions. We might be wondering about, um, you know, what happens to this data. We might be sort of linking back to some of the, the frames of reference that we saw at the start of the story. What does it mean to classify emotion in this way? We might be thinking about maybe what the concerns about things like privacy, data collection. We might think about questions around um, uh, how could this technology be governed and regulated? I think those are all relevant ethical questions. So those kind of initial framings that I've offered are quite helpful for thinking about this new technology that we're presented with. However, we need to get a bit more into the depth of how this technology is designed to work to kind of fully understand, I think, or at least slightly more understand where we might be ethically with this technology. So here's a little bit on um, the kinds of experiments that were designed to be carried out with children using this, this uh, emotion recognition. Okay, so um, the experiment was set up with something like this. The child would be placed in a room with the doll. The, the medical experts, and in this case, because it's a, a, an experimental setting, the computer scientists would be sat next door looking at the results as they came up on the laptop. Uh, the child's parents would also be sat next door. This was the design of the experiment at this moment. And the doll itself would ask the children questions. So it would say, if it would introduce itself to the child, for example, and it would ask the child its name, how old it is, those sorts of things. And the expectation was hopefully that the child would find this a kind of initial way to kind of engage with the doll. The experiment would then move on to ask the doll, asking the, the, the children a series of questions. 
fairly straightforward questions, things like, do you like ice cream? Uh, singing the child a song and asking if they like the song. There's also some strange questions in there, like who is your boyfriend, girlfriend, which seems a bit odd to ask a young child, but there were. So this is how the experiment was designed. As it moved on, the questions would become somewhat stranger in my view. So question six, are you afraid of the dark? Do you like spiders? Uh, question nine, have you ever seen an injured bird? Uh, question 12, is your mum beautiful? So quite unusual questions, I think, to ask a young child. And the idea here is that these would provoke emotional responses, emotional responses that the system could then detect. So let's have a think through some of the sorts of questions that we could ask of this technology. There's an element of this that looks a little bit like the sorts of questions that were asked of the potentially synthetic humans in Blade Runner, right? There's a kind of an attempt to not just ask questions in order to receive an answer, but ask questions in order to provoke an emotional response, right? So um, to ask, um, you know, uh, uh, why or when do you get angry is to try and get the child to, to, to think about that sort of situation. Or do you like spiders would be to try and prov provoke some kind of emotional response. It was not neutral in any particular way. Coming up with a use for this technology is also kind of closely tied to the sorts of ethical questions that we might ask. There's no time here to go through the kind of thousands of years of philosophy dedicated to questions of ethics, but just very quickly, there's kind of three principal ethical positions we could take here. One, we could take what's often called the sort of deontological position on ethics, which is we come up with a series of principles that would be ethical, and then we'd say, well, does this technology match the principles? The difficulty here I found in trying to take that sort of approach, and there's various ethical frameworks out there over the development of and innovation in things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. The difficulty I face with those is that they are either so general that they have to be kind of reworked for any particular technology, or they're so specific that when a new technology comes along, it doesn't really match the kinds of questions or principles that you might ask. A different sort of ethical approach would be what's called consequentialist ethics, where we look more at the consequences of a particular technology, a particular new innovation, and we say, well, are those ethical or not? That's kind of interesting and, and works in some situations, but when we're looking at the development of a new technology, that's somewhat problematic, I think, because we've been sort of leaving the technology to the point where it is developed and it is out there in the world, and then we'd be saying, what are the ethical consequences of that? So we need something where we can kind of feed in at a slightly earlier stage into those ethical questions. So the approach that I followed more often is a kind of ethics in practice approach. I use my kind of access to the project, access to the development of a new technology to just kind of keep posing ethical questions as things go along and to try and sort of see what the responses are to that and to see if I can even shape the development and design of the technology as it's being built. Then, of course, at the end of the project, I'd provide a big ethical report on it. But coming up with a use for this technology is difficult because it's so future oriented. This is a project at an early stage of development. There's air experimentation here in this situation involving children and the potential future for a kind of therapeutic use for this doll. But what would count as a misuse for this, you know, a kind of big ethical problem around this technology? What would count as misuse? Do we find that using this doll in a therapeutic situation is itself potentially ethically wrong in some way? Maybe. But also what other uses could this technology be put to? If we get to the point where streams of digital visual data can be sifted through and our emotions read from that data, that seems to open up a whole range of potential uses or what we might want to call misuses, depending on how those are used. Would we be happy, for example, if our laptops or our smartphones could use this kind of technology to read our emotions and understand how we respond, for example, to particular forms of marketing and, and you know, sort of tailor adverts to us that, that sort of were tailored to how the system understood our emotional responses? Or would we be happy if this sort of system was used in collaboration with social media and things like news feeds and things like shaping our particular political preferences, for example? Once 
you have a kind of successful system in place for sifting through streams of digital video data and analyzing particular patterns within a certain range, for example, emotions, then that can be put to all kinds of different uses. So our ethical questions have to have this kind of eye towards the future. Have to also keep in mind, you know, can these potential misuses or these uses that would have significant ethical concerns, can they be in some way prevented? Can we do something at the design stage to try and limit this? In our particular scenario here, being useful, having a kind of system that works, having a system that can uh, sift through streams of digital video data requires, I would say, the composition of emotions algorithmically. Although there's lots of talk of emotion recognition or emotion detection, what seems to happen in practice is more like composition. There's questions there to provoke emotional responses rather than just detect emotional responses. And there's work done to carefully classify emotions, classify digital data into particular emotional categories, and then to have action that follows on from that. So the computer scientists are doing a huge amount of work here in the same way that the, that the perceptron effectively, they were doing a huge amount of work to kind of limit how gender could be understood there's a huge amount of work here to set boundaries for what an emotion is and to understand how that emotion can be read by a digital video analytics system. To some extent, this system also involves composing what a child is, right? That there's certain things that a child will respond to emotionally. There's certain ways that a child will display that emotion on their face. There's certain ways then that a face can be read and classified. It's interesting that it doesn't quite sort of map directly onto things like the Blade Runner situation where uh, an adequate emotional responses suggest you're either human or not. But what it does do is suggest that humans should be understood as having emotions within certain kinds of boundaries, certain kinds of classification. So on this basis, to be a kind of adequately emotional child is to be able to display emotions that fit within, or at least can be fitted within those classifications by the system. What's also interesting though is talking to the computer scientists to some extent, but looking also at the sort of public documentation around this technology and other similar technologies that do similar sorts of work, is that this work of composition is very rarely publicly discussed. The emphasis almost always stays on detection or recognition rather than composition. So that work done to design a system that can read emotions, that work done to classify the world so it fits into a set of kind of clear cut categories which can then be used by the system to offer responses, that work done to design responses to, in this case, emotions, is all kind of pushed to one side. Okay, so the, the work done to create these sorts of emotions, to design emotions, to design appropriate responses is split away from the, the system itself in public documents. And the relationship between the system and the emotion is effectively inverted. So rather than the emotion being a pre-existing thing, which is now simply detected or recognized, instead it's inverted. And um, what we see in practice is there's a huge amount of work done to provoke that emotion, to classify that emotion, to compose a situation in which that emotion can be made sense of. This is quite important for ethics because if the discussion remains focused on emotion detection and emotion recognition, then that implies a kind of objectivity that the emotions are always out there and all the system is doing is simply kind of picking those up from the world out there and then telling us what those emotions are. It's kind of missing out all of that work done to kind of build and compose these emotions and appropriate responses to these emotions. We haven't got time to talk about it today, but what's interesting in many of these projects I've worked on is that there's a sort of move after this experimental phase from kind of algorithmic composition. So the work done to kind of design the algorithms, design the system, design uh, how the system's gonna work to then what we might call market composition, building a kind of set of relations into which this technology can be moved in order to monetize it, in order to sell it, in order to have clients for it. 
So this has been a talk about emotions. It's been a talk a bit about ethics as well. So I'm interested to hear how do you feel about this? And I'll stop there for now. So if anyone has any questions, if anyone wants to, to raise any, any kinds of issues, do go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, if, if anybody wants to uh, 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 ask a question or comment, uh, feel free to do that. Um, and I, I have one question that sort of um, um, seems important to me at this point is like, um, what, what kind of company um, uh, was working or has been working on this uh, 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 on this doll, on this uh, AI doll. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a few different sorts of companies that work in this area more generally in terms of emotions and emotion recognition. Right? So there's a lot of interest among social media companies and big data companies yeah. around um, uh, doing emotion recognition. This particular project, we started off with um, uh, some academic computer scientists who are interested in this as more or less a scholarly exercise, the experiments, for example, are going to be used as a basis for testing out their own capabilities in, in designing a piece of software for us. The companies involved are, um, to some extent, actually hardware companies that provide the kind of networking and other bits of technological components mm -hmm. with which this software can work. What we also see saw though during the project, which raised a whole series of other ethical questions, wasn't sure if we get onto this today, is one of the very, very large data companies. Uh, uh, not sure if I should mention the name, but one that uh, is perhaps dominant uh, uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the sort of data field, tried to buy up mm -hmm. uh, one of the firms that was really kind of central in terms of the mm -hmm. intellectual property in this, 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 uh, this development. And then what they would, I presume what they would do at that point is by buying up the company, and if, you know, it's a tiny company in comparison to the big data company, they would effectively just buy up the rights to this technology, which they could then utilize in their own way. So it goes to that question of sort of future use and misuse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so basically the, um, um, the, 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 the one company that you, um, you have been collaborating with uh, was not really kind of a, a profit-driven enterprise, but more of a kind of a science-oriented uh, project, wasn't it? Well, so the smaller companies would look to make some money from these sorts of technologies, okay. but they were mostly in that kind of realm of startup tech, uh, startup tech companies, so quite mm -hmm. small. Um, in most of the projects I've worked on, actually, apart from uh, one or two examples of very large organisations, and they would mostly be small tech startups, sort of teams of four or five people, yeah. and um, often with a view to the techno to the company being bought out at some point. Um, so the profit would not necessarily be a kind of sales-driven profit okay. Okay. in terms of the technology, but often um, uh, <laughs> more oriented towards the the, the 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 company being bought up. And some of these people were involved in multiple startups. And it kind of sort of almost like hedging their bets. They'd be involved in three or four of these firms at any one time. And if anyone got bought up, that would be great. But they'd then probably start another startup focused on something else. So, yeah. so they were kind of uh, 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 so data entrepreneurs, but they would work on a lot of different things at the same time. Um, that was mostly it. Um, there was at least not in this particular project, but there was one other project that involved a team of quite active um, sort of management consultants who would look also to utilize these sorts of um, software developments to then um, build relationships with particular clients where they could then recommend these kinds of uh, uh, technologies as a solution to their problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you, you know what I'm kind of driving at uh, since the, um, the, the people with money always determine you know, the, uh, what, what is going to be uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the technology for like like eventually and then determining a uh, lot of ethical questions uh, about this this very technology. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. That's why I'm sort of asking about that because it seems kind of uh, quite essential. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but it's almost impossible for me within that. You know, I I I'm there for the limited time frame of the project, right? And the project is a really interesting kind of construct here because it's normally yeah. three years, sometimes four at the most. Uh, and um, you know, then, then, then it 
can just go out into the world, right? And then not much I can do to, to, to do anything, to, to have a say at that point. Yeah, of course. Um, any questions from, uh, from the audience? I have one question. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead so yeah. I am uh, wondering about the IA uh, doll uh, project, mm -hmm. and especially in terms of like the children being unable to consent to this uh, uh, taking part in the project and the invasion of privacy. So mm -hmm. could you give us any information about the effectivity of the project? Yeah. Or is yeah. there like, the, the decrease in their mental health in the future when they are suddenly aware of the uh, aspects of the project? Yeah. OK, so I had significant concerns about um, the children as participants in this project. So much of the work on uh, 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 video analytics requires really careful consideration of consent even if it involves adults. So in a previous project, for example, uh, on airport security um, that was focused on um, trying to understand um, uh, uh, how people move through airport spaces, we worked um, extensively on the consent and ensured that everyone who was sort of recorded um, uh, uh, could consent to that and that their data, or, or they could refuse to consent to it and so it wouldn't be part of in this case, with young children, it's very difficult to manage consent, of course. Um, you know, at what age do we assume that children are able to consent adequately to this? You know, to what extent can a sort of five-year-old child consent to a project that's involving very complex artificial intelligence situations? And also, you know, sort of aligned with that, that this is a... a, a a doll that would be used in therapeutic situations where children might already be suffering from significant mm -hmm. potential mental health issues. So my view on this, and this perhaps sounds very strong, was that these experiments shouldn't go ahead. Okay, I couldn't ethically justify that these experiments should take place. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that consent could be handled adequately. I didn't think that the potential impact on children could be handled satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. And I drew a line under that. Although this is a publicly funded project. I drew a line under that. I said, I don't think we can have children in this. We certainly can't have children with emotional vulnerabilities in this. And so that part of the project was, was drawn to a close at that point. Now, I mean, the question is, is that ethically right or wrong? I think it was ethically right to do that. But there may be people that think actually there's a way of handling the, the, the data and the consent issues around this. For me, it wasn't something that I felt comfortable with at all. Um, and the experiments could to some extent go ahead with um, four members of the project team who would know what was going on and was kind of you know effective participants in this. And so you could still do some work on emotional recognition if you wanted to, but um, that was a much more kind of limited set of um, uh, potential ethical concerns that might arise. But Julia, what do you think? Would you allow these experiments to go ahead if you had the chance? Well, um, me personally, I I don't think I would. Uh, simply, yeah, due to the fact that I do believe that a child, uh, or like basically a human, should be aware of what it, what they are involved in. So since a child is not really capable to uh, um, be aware of the situation, um, I don't think they should be participants in such a matter. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with, uh, with both of you. Um, thank you, Julia, for your question. Uh, any questions, um, any other questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question kind of following um, uh, my friend. So if like if we think about uh, children taking part in that kind of experiments, did any attempts of that kind of experiments uh, take place, but with adults taking part then? Yeah, yeah. So the effort after that was to use um, project participants to engage in experiments. And this is something that um, has happened in other projects I've been involved with as well, where issues of consent are so complex that 
that the people who really understand what it is that they're signing up to are the people who are involved in some way, at least, you know, maybe around the, the they're sort of involved at the edges, but um, they can at least kind of have a kind of informed consent of what it is that they're getting involved in. So there were some experiments that went forward with this. Um, the, you, I don't know if you remember this, but in, earlier on in the, the, the presentation, I talked about the 86% um, accuracy rate for the system. Um, that didn't prove to be the same uh, accuracy rate in practice. It's a very common feature of video analytics that you can train a system to work very well on a defined set of data because the system is very good at training itself to offer what it then learns are the correct answers for that data. Once you then get sort of, you know, I, how does that sort of out in the wild a bit more where, um, you know, it's not a kind of constrained set of data, but it's actually people perhaps expressing their emotions or, or um, in the case of the project on people walking through the airport, you know, people actually not just sort of following a normal pattern, but actually just walking as they walk through the airport. Um, the, 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 uh, the accuracy rate of these technologies drops significantly. And, and that's a huge problem when we talk about the use case for these technologies. Many of them fail to work in very complex situations. And so then the move is often to try and simplify the situation rather than to sort of uh, address the issues of how the machine can can address the complexities of a situation. So for example, in the airport, initially things like face recognition technologies would try and operate live in the airport. And that's very difficult to do, very difficult to do. We can recognize what a face is quite successfully, but actually identifying a particular face as being attached to a particular person with any degree of certainty is much harder. And so in the airport, Obviously, what we see over the last 15 years is the development of this whole kind of architectural infrastructure where if you want to do face recognition, you stand on a particular part of the floor where there's footprints in front of you. There's a barrier stopping you moving forward initially. There's lighting, lighting up your face to give the best lighting conditions. There's cameras that adjust to the height of your face and then read your face and then try and match that face to your passport, right? So rather than trying to do it sort of in the wild of the airport, or just people walking past the whole time, you, would, you sort of simplify the situation. You create these kind of rat traps that stop people from moving, and by holding them still, then you try and do face recognition or at least using someone's face to identify them. And I don't know if it's the same for you, but on many times it still doesn't work, right? But, but that, that works more than trying to do these things uh, in the wild. The suggestion always is among these projects that these are kind of technical problems that will at some point be solved. That might be the case you know, over the last 10 years in particular, so from about 2012 onwards, do see advances in um, the capacity of these technologies to actually identify specific sorts of activities by sifting through um, streams of digital video data. Uh, it just depends how specific you then want to get or how complicated you want to get. So in terms of specificity, if you want to identify specific individuals, it depends how you want to do that. It's, it's difficult to do that in a kind of just, a, a, you know, a, a, a live city center situation with multiple cameras across a big space. Um, if you want to identify particular activities, it, you can try, but it, the, the rate of success is low. Over the next five or 10 years, though, we might see that with these projects continuing and, you know, still millions of pounds of public money, but also lots of money from um, um, large uh, data firms, for example, going into this, we might see uh, these technologies becoming more successful. So I never want to use... The, the fact that sometimes these technologies don't work as a kind of ethical get out, because I think that's dangerous. You know, if we just keep saying, oh, well, the technology doesn't work, so the ethical issues are now <laughs> redundant, that's dangerous, right? Because next year or in five years, these technologies might, might work in a more sophisticated way than they do now. So we need to maintain uh, those ethical questions. We need to maintain uh, access to these projects. We need to maintain the ability to ask questions of these projects, I think. 
What's good about the publicly funded projects is they often do come with a remit to have an ethical uh, component to them. So to have someone like a social scientist involved, to have them kind of get up close to what's going on, and to have the ability to pull the plug on certain things if they look incredibly unethical. Well, I'm, but I'm sure that you know, even though this project was was effectively killed, there will be, as you would say, kind of no. <laughs> I didn't no, quite no. kill it, but I stopped some parts of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So fair, fair enough. Uh, but I'm sure that that um, similar or, or identical projects uh, are or will be happening very soon because mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, uh, there is money in it, um, a lot of it. Um, I have a kind of a different question, sort of uh, maybe maybe a silly one. Um, how many women? And uh, and ethnically diverse uh, uh, people were involved in these projects that you worked with. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, in this one, in this case, not many. Um, it was um, a largely white male project, and as the experiments went forward in terms of you know uh, using people from or associated with the project, that remained the same. Looking at some of the other projects that I've worked on, there's been a bit more effort to do that. So with the airport project, for example, there'd be a bit more effort to look at the sort of diversity of the participants involved and to try and understand if there were differences and different complexities and trying to sort of um, uh, uh, pick out patterns of behavior and whether that there were any results that sort of reflected um, uh, uh, different results for people from different gender, for different ethnic backgrounds and so on. Other projects have found that in some of these um, uh, uh, algorithmically driven projects, you know, specific issues do occur um, uh, uh, in things like um, uh, trying to pick out behavior in airports. There's been projects that have found um, uh, behavior tends to be picked out more effectively if there is a kind of high contrast between the person carrying out that activity and the background colors of the airport. So if you have to be wearing clothes that are the same color as the background, it's much more difficult to pick you out. But this can also reflect skin color as well. You know, it's more actually easier to pick out, which is not to necessarily say that, that um, people from a minority ethnic background will always get picked out more. It, it, could, be, it could be someone uh, with white skin or anything else. It just depends on, um, uh, uh, things like color contrast ratios, but if you happen to stand out from the background, you're much more likely to be picked out. <laughs> that's, that's not necessarily a great, great thing, but um, that's, you know, a, a, a sort of implicit bias that's built into these technologies. What's interesting for working with some of the computer scientists is that they're very um, interested in these issues too. And so many of the computer scientists do take a step back from this, and it's not some um, uh, thing where they're just kind of slavishly working away on, um, on sort of coding and things like that. They do take a step back and try and look at things like the consequences of designing a system one way or another. Um, and in, in, in all kinds of different ways, you know, that's the sort of computational consequences, but also um, the consequences in terms of what decisions follow. So you know, I've had really long and quite interesting discussions with some of the computer scientists working in these projects about these issues. And there's a kind of, there's a real openness and interest in doing, um, uh, doing sort of technology development and software development, which could somehow take into account all different sorts of issues that might arise um, while testing the technology out. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Uh, if not, I have one final question, Daniel. Yeah, sure. um, again, maybe it's the one. What is the point of AI doll? It's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the justification that this could be used in a therapeutic situation, mm -hmm. you know, it seemed reasonably genuine. You know, I mean, I, I didn't really have any any particular reason to doubt that that was why it was why it was being developed. Although the the, the funding body were a bit wary of it. Um, the point of it might be, you know, that it that there were um, um, children that that, that had uh, uh, difficulties expressing emotions. 
the justification that the doll could read those emotions so it didn't necessarily seem to play out in any kind of clear practice um, you know if 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 a child's emotions were difficult to read i'm not sure the doll would do it better yeah i'm just i'm just thinking you know if, if it if it's not more um you know uh efficient to basically especially if we have um children with uh, having suffered from some traumatic events mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to have uh, a, a, a human therapist instead of a uh, AI doll. Although, okay, the, possibly the, the the child might divulge more to yeah. a, a, a kind of a personal doll more than to a kind of no, a, a, no, a, a strange, uh, no, uh, unknown um, person in 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 strange clothes, right? So maybe yeah. that's, that's right. The rationale. So, so the, the 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 in sort of broad terms, the rationale for these technology developments is often in situations where there's a huge amount of data to sift through and the system itself can do that at a very cheap cost <laughs> very quickly, right? It can take in, on board terabytes of data and analyze those to pick out the patterns that it's been trained to pick out very, very quickly and make those decisions, right? So this kind of situation is unusual for these sorts of projects because it's not about huge amounts of, of data and, and, and huge amounts of kind of complexity in terms of numerous things happening at the same time. It's one child with one doll. So that usual justification is not there. And I'm not suggesting that this is at all the motivations of the people involved in the project, but one might imagine that a future implementation of this emotion recognition system would be very much on that basis, mm -hmm. sifting through huge amounts of data and deciding on a huge number of emotional responses very quickly. Yeah. Like, but do you like that advert? Are you happy with that advert? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Go, Boom, there's yeah. a response. Right. Commercially, that's kind of that's huge, good, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely huge. And, and, and matches up with various kind of, you know, science fiction type representations of this, but you yeah, can, yeah. that is involved, that's sort of, you know, perhaps inclined towards that. Could it ever be the case that this sort of technology would work well for children in therapeutic situations, possibly. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it might still be just mm -hmm. as appropriate to have uh, a, 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 a human there and a sort of kind of warmer relationship with the child than than the adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I think this research um, uh, and of the questions that um, AI is is raising. Uh, no, absolutely of paramount importance to 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 um, and to us, our culture and society, and and also uh, um, no uh, governance, right? Because some mm -hmm. must mm -hmm. must some, somehow regulate and harness all these uh, no, um, all these uh, uh, no, uh, projects. That's why I, I think that 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 your your uh, your research is absolutely uh, fascinating and brilliant, and I'm so happy that you could share. Um, with us today, uh, some of its uh, conclusions and observations. Daniel, thank you very much again. Thank you very much for inviting oh. me today. It's been great. I've been really enjoying uh, it. Yes. Um, before we go, I just want to sort of invite um, all of you uh, for for other events in the New Media and Contemporary Culture series next month. In uh, uh, more or less uh, two weeks, my guest will be Dan Hast Forrest from the Utrecht University, uh, speaking more, uh, uh, I mean, less uh, on uh, these heavy ethical uh, subjects and problems um, and more about visual culture, transmediality, uh, fandom and, uh, and some, and, and, and uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, having said that, um, let me uh, you know, give thanks Daniel again to you. Uh, for, for agreeing to, uh, to, to present uh, your research and all of um, you in the audience for uh, being here with us, asking questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Uh, take care and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.